eight o'clock. So I think um, let's start. I just confirm that you can hear me, please. I can hear you, Prof. Okay, fantastic. So um, we're gonna have just basically two parts um, to the presentation. So the first bit, um, I'm gonna use, you know, just to help recruit your alveoli, you know, those who have had an afternoon nap. So we're gonna start with some uh, cases to discuss. I've got about five cases. And so the first hour is going to be the, um, the case discussion. And then the next hour we'll then do my presentation. So we'll do it like we do um, in the morning meeting. I'll put up a case and uh, you must, you know, basically discuss what you see, what your plan is, but try and get moving, you know, with your, um, with your answers. We'll have about 10 minutes per case. Alrighty, so um, let me just prepare to share my screen. And um, which one? Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Anyone, can you see the screen? Yes, Prof, I can see. And can you see the presentations, like the presentation mode or the one with where all the slides are showing? Which one can you so see? It's just the presentation mode, it's in case for discussion 2021. Okay, fantastic. Um, let me see who I shall pick on first. Um, Francis, are you ready? Okay, great. So, um, Okay, so that's our first case. Uh, it's a 36 year old. Look, some of those cases may be familiar to you guys because they are actually from our hospital. So a 36 year old female and she's an MVA passenger. So there you go. Okay, so um, this looks like on the left, uh, lower half of a Lodox and on the right, the upper half of a Lodox. Um, not quite showing all four limbs. Starting on the left side, the obvious pathology is a right segmental femur fracture with um, a subtrochanteric and a diaphyseal component. Um, no associated injury of the knee and ankle on that side. Don't see any associated pelvic fracture. And the right side appears to be intact. I can just see the bottom of the right forearm and note an ulnar fracture on that particular image. Um, then moving on to the right-sided image, it's the upper half of the lodox excluding the left arm. So um, obvious pathology again is a distal third diaphyseal humerus fracture. Um, that appears to have a butterfly segment and some comminution. And again, the ulnar fracture between the two images. I don't see any obvious radial fracture, but I'll want. Okay, uh, great. So look, I think because we, we're discussing yes. femur fractures this evening, yep. so I can just concentrate on the femur fracture now. Okay, so the femur fracture, um, obviously I'd like to get um, dedicated views um, so I can look at the head and neck uh, uh, better, thank you. Um, so again, no associated pelvic injury, head and neck appear intact. So it's a transverse subtrochanteric fracture um, together with a comminuted diaphyseal fracture. So the, the proximal fracture is transverse. It's about 25% medially translated. And... Um, the proximal segment on the lateral image is flexed up, so with um, posterior translation relative to that of the distal segment. Okay, so what's your plan? Uh, for this patient, I would like to um, obviously manage according to ATLS principles. Yeah, yeah, no, no, just yeah. skip all okay. of that. We'll yeah. discuss a few months today. Skip to, skip to surgery. Okay, so obviously this patient requires surgery. So immediate management will be uh, temporary st stabilization and a Thomas splint, um, optimized for theater. 
And then I would ideally like to do a kephalomedullary nail or angle stable fixation for the subtrochanteric fracture. Um, no, no, no. Okay. Are you offering two options now? Um, no, so, so a single option would be a kephalomedullary nail that will address both fractures. Okay. I'm just a little concerned because there is um, a, like, a higher likelihood that one of the fractures won't unite. So an alternative would be a proximal uh, DHS and a, um, a retrograde femur nail. Look, I mean, just now you said that the proximal fracture was subtrochanteric. So do we do a DHS for subtroch fractures? No, we, we just do a, we do a... Because you, you are now answering for what, because that discussion is really if we have an intertrochanteric fracture and a shaft fracture, that's fine. That's where you can discuss the option of a DHS, but you can't yeah. mention subtroch and a DHS in the same sentence. Got it. Yeah, no, so the, this one, my preference would be a, a kephalomedullary nail. Okay. You're happy with that? Uh, relatively happy with that. Uh, let me just look at it. Um, so this looks like it's a little ways down the line, just looking at the more distal fracture, we can see that already appears to be united, but, or well on its way so to you. Um, for suture removal, that's why you see the sutures. Okay. And um, more proximally, there does not appear to be union of the proximal fracture. Uh, commenting on the fixation, um, again, uh, it's not a directly post-op um, extra, so I'm not sure if there has been any migration, but the, the distal most of the two proximal screws looks like it might have a bit of lucency around it laterally um, and possibly could have come back a little bit. Um, either the screws were long or um, they've backed up a little bit. Fixed in that position, you know, there's nothing okay. that's backed out. Alrighty, so this is at six weeks now. So what do you tell her? Okay, so um, again, ha happy with the um, distal fragment, distal fracture. At six weeks, um, I'm a bit more concerned about the proximal fragment, but it's still a bit early to call it a non-union. It does look like maybe there's a little bit of something happening on the medial cortex. So um, I would probably still give it a little bit of time, but I'd plan to keep a close eye on her and if she doesn't show any progress. Okay, is there anything we can optimize at the moment? Um, so just her, her host status. Um, so if there are any um, comorbidities if she's smoking, that she's not taking excessive NSAIDs and um, she must bear weight. She must bear weight on the femur to stimulate. And anything she must take to promote bone healing? Because when I, I agree, look, we don't often offer patients anything at six months, uh, at six weeks, sorry. But yeah. if she comes at six weeks now, for a femur, you've rightly mentioned that you're concerned and, and that you would expect far more colors formation, which you are getting distally, but just not enough of it approximate. Yeah. And of course, if you were to choose, which one would you rather have more colors? Probably proximally. <laughs> okay. Alrighty, so you can give a vitamin D, you know, um, at this point, it's six weeks. This is when you want all the odds to be in your favor. So you give a vitamin D, ask you to keep loading it, all right? Okay, the inevitable happens. She comes back at eight weeks, looking like that. All right, so um, we now have failure of the nail and translation of the fracture, which hasn't united the distal fracture union. It has progressed further and satisfactorily. Um, it doesn't appear that the screws have failed out of the head. It's, it's the proximal portion that has broken at the screw holes. So um, obviously she will now need a planned revision of her fixation. Okay. Um, so first I would want to, um, again, look at the host, 
Yeah, I have to okay, fine. Right. Post you go to optimize, you're gonna check you're gonna check uh, nutrition, you're gonna give your algae, all those things. But now uh, that's the problem that you're faced with. So what are you gonna do so, for us? So surgically I'd like to revise the nails. So um, this would obviously involve removal of the nail um, and consider um, a new it would have to be an open reduction. A uh, more stable fixation, so I'd consider probably a different nail, a wider nail, and maybe a combined lag screw fixation in the head. Sorry, what do you call that uh, surgery that you're planning to do? Exchange nailing, yes, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. this is a failed diaphysial type fracture, and the core standard is exchange nailing with a wider diameter um, nail. So what is your concern now approximately in the neck with your uh, chest nail? So the concern here is that now, um, having had the two prior screws, there, there will now be a defect and the neck will be difficult to achieve adequate purchase. Um, so I would need to consider having augments available. Um, so there, there's some options where you can use cement or a different kind of screw that's wider. Um, okay, there's your exchange naming. You've got a wider nail, you've got a different screw. Are you happy now? I'm happier now. Um, is it really a wider nail? <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, this is, this is, uh, what nail is that? That, that's a PFNA prof. Yeah, it is a word and name, I can assure um, you. There, there hasn't been uh, cement up the neck or anything like that, just not osteoporotic. It doesn't, it looks like the fixation in the neck is all also, right. remember she's quite young, so we don't, we don't tend to cement patients with a uh, normal bone because yeah. you can't get cement out of a neck into the, into the hard bone. <laughs> Alrighty, so that's what you've got, and you send her on your way, and she's happy, you're happy, and she comes back in two months. Okay. <laughs> All right, plan C. Um, so, same problem now, I consider new approach um so nails haven't been our friends here um i think my next thing i would try short of so we might have exhausted our thicker nail options is to consider locked plating uh but obviously at the fracture site adequate debridement to bleeding bone healthy bone and consider augmenting with uh, what with, um Something like deep mineralized bone. Um, she is, you've got like a failed fixation, it's failed twice, and you still want to give something demineralized. What is the best um, way to stimulate? Uh, sorry, or, um, autologist autographed. Ah, so that's what you want to consider. Like, I mean, you can't just sort of half heartedly throw no, stuff. Yeah, no, it's the big guns, the big mm -hmm. gun. So the nail, you know, has failed. Um, what's the hitting um, with nailing? What kind of healing do you get? Uh, you get relative stability and indirect bone healing. So that is failed twice. So now, what kind of um, um, stability do you think you should consider? We want absolute stability with good compression and direct no, bone healing. Of course, it's not often your first answer in femur fractures, but you know this is a special situation. And also, you know, well, you answer, don't say you consider a locked plate. I mean, you'll see why we don't call it locked plate. Just say you, okay. you consider a proximal femur plate. And, okay. um, and then with that, because you don't want it for the locking option. What do you want it for? Uh, you want it to achieve that compression and- You want it for compression, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So that's what you've got. That's why your first two screws in that are not locked. You want them absolutely compressed. And then of course, those are the screws that determine your biology at the fracture site. And then the other two screws, you can decide how you want to do them. Okay, what do you think happened next? Uh, with this patient, I think it happened again. <laughs>
So that's that's her that's her United. But as you can see, she's not a big fan of removing clips. So because I mean, this is now United, but she still has putting clips on. Okay, cool. Francis, you can sit down. Um, let's move on to Hamad. Are you there? Yes, I draw. Hey, great. So yeah. this is um, let's find your case. Okay, so you've got a 48-year-old maid who fell off a scaffolding. It's an isolated fracture and it's open. So I think you must move a little bit faster than Francis now. Okay, so we presented with the uh, AP and lateral of the distal femur on the left and a full femur AP view on the right. So we have a distal third uh, open fracture. I don't know the grade um, of the open fracture. So it's, it's a distal fine. third uh, extra articular uh, it's a fairly common muted fracture. Um, this will need to be fixed. Next available, uh, next available theater slot. Uh, we would go for indirect. Um, sorry, we'd go for uh, secondary healing in this case. Uh, I think a retrograde femur nail would uh, would work here, as we have adequate box distally for at least three three screws, um, three locking screws in our retrograde femur nail. Okay, and what's the proximal extent of your nail? So the proximal extent, it will uh, extend all the way to the lesser trochanter. Um, I'd like to put two proximal locking screws as this is a length unstable um, fracture pattern. Okay, so that's your post-op x-ray. You yeah, so... That's your well, plan. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like they have three screws distally, which is adequate. The, the nail looks like it's sitting extra articular, not in the joint. The only thing I see one proximal locking screw, the nail is fairly, I think it's a bit short. Um, I would have gone slightly longer. Um, uh, and I would have put two screws proximally. Okay, that's your other view. Uh, so this is. So this I think, the, yeah, this is post up. So there may be an issue with the rotation, um, with the with the distal fragment. Um, how how long post up? So it looks like the fractures this you might have. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah, see yeah, the so, gas in the tissues too. Yeah, so some gas in the tissue. Uh, I think our reduction is. I suppose it would be it's acceptable. Um, it looks like they've tried to put two Reduction screws in. What is acceptable? So I think the the alignment of the of the femur. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've attempted to put two screws in proximally. I'm not sure what that shadow is there uh, at the top. Which shadow? This one. Yeah, that one. Or is that just soft tissue? Well, it's there also. It's there as well. So I think they've attempted two screws proximally and they've uh, failed with the first one. So they've only gone with one slightly more distal. Okay. So that's a potential stress riser. Alrighty. So you're saying you're quite happy with the distal fix and the reduction? Yeah, I think it's acceptable. Um, with all that comminution, uh, I think that we, we can accept that. Okay, so that's the CT scan. What I will show you. So the CT scan, what do I did? But so the nail is perhaps in the uh, slightly proud in the notch. Uh, the knee uh, looks like that the femur is subluxed anteriorly. I'm not sure if there's a con uh, there's a concurrent um, ligamentous knee injury, uh, and the. Do you think this is a blast or what can it be if you go, if you look at this and you look at that, what's going on here? Oh, so there's an intra-articular fracture that is missed. Okay. Distal okay. intra-articular extension. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So sorry if I missed that. Yeah, so there's distal, there's intra-articular extension of that okay. uh, medial condyle. So the whole condyle is missed. Okay. Yeah. There's a condylar fracture here. Yeah. All right, what next? 
So what makes this patient, because it's an intraarticular uh, fracture and we've missed a step there, we, we can't have a step in the joint that predisposes to OA, uh, post-traumatic OA. This patient will need to be taken back to theater. Uh, the screw is likely removed. Uh, the fracture is reduced and plated, and then we can reinsert those screws through the nail once that uh, fragment's reduced. Okay. And of, of course, the treating surgeons were still discussing and deciding their options. Yes. And that's what happened. Yeah. So it failed proximally, like we said, potential stress rises there. Okay, um, so you go back here, do you remember what happened here? And so yeah. you can see. This is not just one drill hole, there are multiple attempts at locking this yeah. proximally. Yeah. All right, that's, that's where you are. So now because we've, yeah, so we've potentially failed this with a fixation as well, and now we need to address the subtrochanteric fracture. We can no longer use a retrograde nail. So I would do an anti-grade uh, cephalomodality nail and then fix the distal fragment with a with a with a, in a bridge plating bridge plating technique with a with a, um, lateral femur plate. So where's your nail gonna end? Your probably nail. Yeah. yeah so I would do so in this. Yeah. In this case specifically, I would opt for a short a short nail. Short after uh, uh, So it would it would yeah. end. So now I would want it to overlap the plate and nail so the plate would overlap the nail so i would end maybe about say three or four centimeters proximal to the fracture and have my plate extend proximally so beyond the nail. nail yeah can you see my arrow yes so i say you'd end the nail three or four centimeters proximal to the fracture and extend the the, the plate beyond the what length is that nail? So your short nails, I think they come in 12 or 15. Also, you're going to use a short nail a short, proximally. A short nail proximally. Nail. Yeah, proximal femur nail. Okay. All righty. Let's hear other options. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, who else is on the call? Let's see who I can pick on. Um, Ashley? Um, uh, yeah, Prophet, that's a option. Is, is it an open option to do a careful or medullary nail uh, and then combine it with a distal femur plate and try and uh, put your screws for the plate around the nail? I think that is an option. No, but the question here is where, where is your I mean, where's your proximal nail going to end? Uh, yeah, what, what I was thinking is uh, not necessarily uh, putting in a short nail, uh, put in a kephalo medullary nail. Yeah, no, I accept that, but where is it going to end distally? Uh, uh, just above the patella. Okay. Uh, because, uh, but you've seen the yes. problem we had with the previous nail because of the, the yeah, whole but, but segment here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping to combine it with, uh, with the distal femur locking plate. So the kephalomedullary medullary nail will address the, the proximal fracture uh, and then try to address the distal fracture with the uh, distal femur plate, essentially. Okay, I'll take one more uh, example, uh, one more option. Um, Kim? Hi, Prof. Hi, yeah, let's hear your, your, your suggestion. Prof, I'm quite concerned about the medial comminution of that distal femur. Um, I would assess intra op. So I would open both fractures because I think that you're going to struggle. First, well, you need to remove that nail. Um, so I would remove the nail. I would try and focus on what's important. So focus on uh, reducing the intraarticular fracture in the knee um, and then uh, restore the length and alignment as well as uh, reduce the subtrochanteric fracture. Then I would um, 
I would prioritize probably putting it if I get a good reduction with the um, with the distal femur, I would put the nail in first, as long as it doesn't disrupt my reduction distally. And I would put a long nail and then I would put a long plate as well. And if still unstable, I would even consider a medial plate. The problem is the um, miss the, the nail technique for the screws may be quite difficult. I see he's got quite a narrow um, canal or isthmus. Um, so I would be concerned about that. I would have on standby a backup um, either a, uh, a shorter nail um, and just have a longer lateral plate to make sure that they, there's no gap between them causing a stress riser, or I would have a proximal uh, femoral plate, um, a long proximal femoral plate, just because I'm concerned about, and then I would make the plates overlap themselves um, because I'm not sure if the miss the nail screw technique will work in this patient having so many holes already drilled in and such a narrow canal. All right, so all of you have offered um, two devices. Um, so a nail plus a plate combination. Kim says nail plus plate or maybe plate plus plate. What, any other person has got a different idea? Is anyone? Uh, it's my care. Yes, Mike. Uh, I would probably consider a long plate head to toe. I wouldn't nail it. I just do a, see what the longest uh, plate that I can have. So kind of like that previous one where you had that proximal femur plate, but see if I can get one that goes the whole way down, take the nail out completely. And how long would that be? And what plating principle are you going for? Um, look, you'd want to get primary bone healing in that subtrack uh, fracture. I think if you could get a couple of screws across that mid diaphysical region and a couple of cables, uh, you could achieve primary bone healing. Um, at no, least no, with you're them. Not, you're not contradicting yourself. How can you get primary bone healing with cables? No, no, I said you can get some screws across there and then augment with cables. And get some screws. Uh, to well, what are the cables augmenting? I'm just concerned with that uh, large diaphysical fragment. So my aim would be. The combinations I mean, of primary bone screws, yeah, the subtract fracture. This is all intact, right? So you can get as many screws as you want here. So what's the cable going to do? The uh, cable's more distally, bro. Around here? Yeah. But now... But I, don't have, you... I don't have cables available just to augment my fixation, but essentially I would plate this whole thing hit, uh, top to bottom. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, let's see what happened. Yeah, so that's exactly what, um, what we did. So when I mean, you can see the cannulated screws are outside the plate. So this is really just meant to compress that um, quindula fragment. This is now reduced. And of course, I mean, there's a, I mean, as you know, a few more screws here than I would have wanted to see, but I mean, we'll have this discussion later, but the beauty with this is exactly that you can then have compression in the proximal fragment, which required compression and you've got um, you've got a uh, healing by secondary intention um, distally. And um, there, so she went on to unite. So you have to think out of the box sometimes. Okay, we'll move on to the third case, uh, who shall we pick for this one? Uh, let's see who looks asleep. Benjamin? Yes, Prof. Good evening. Okay. Right. So for you, we have a 45 year old, uh, intoxicated, isolated femur injury. So you must just go quicker now. Okay, Prof. Okay, that's what you've got. Um, I'm presented with a X-ray AP and lateral of a femur. Um, I'd say that P. Um, just the proximal and distal segments. I don't think uh, this is not a lateral as well. Um, it's a short oblique fracture, um, proximal third uh, diaphyseal fracture. Um, I'm not quite sure. It doesn't look like there's an extension of the uh, uh, um, fracture proximally into the neck. Um, distally, I don't see any articular step or any uh, a fracture distally as well. 
buff. Okay, so what are you gonna do for him? Um, based on this, um, manage according to ATLS principles. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. About FEMA. okay, just a FEMA. Um, well, I'll use a, a pro um, anti grade uh, trochanteric FEMA nail, um, with inter uh, inter trochanteric locking technique and then two. Two screws distally as well. Why two screws distally? Or oh, at least why do you emphasize that? Well, um, it, it's short, it's a short oblique, uh, not necessarily length on stable, but I, I mean, it's you, you can put in a, a single screw. So, Well, I mean, what's our policy with um, short oblique or transfer structures? Um, if it's short oblique or transverse, it's 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 length stable, so you can put in a single screw. And which hole do you use for that? The 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 uh, locking hole, not the dynamic one. Once you've achieved your compression. Okay, sorry, Benjamin. You know that yes, uh, there are two holes in the FEMA testily. So yes. why, do you, why do you choose the static one? What's the whole well, idea for the static and the dynamic hole? The dynamic allows for uh, subtle movements with relics um, to achieve uh, secondary bone healing. Which is and what you static... want in a transfer structure, right? Yes. So you agree okay. the structure is made for distal locking with a with the, um, what's it called now? With the other hole that doesn't give you compression. I forgot the word now, sorry. Dynamic locking. This is, so dynamic really, locking. This is made yeah. for dynamic locking. Yes, bro. Okay. I agree. So, so that's exactly our policy is that, you know, if you have a transverse and suddenly, I mean, if there are any uh, MOs on the call. So for the proximal third, or uh, actually any shaft fracture, that is short oblique or transverse and is rotationally stable and length stable, we use one locking hole and that's in the dynamic hole. We we'll only use the two holes for um, fractures which are comminuted or are length unstable. Okay, so I hit with the post op result and you can see this person was thinking, they put the hole here, I mean, they, they put mm -hmm. the screw here, but then remember that they can't defend it in the morning meeting and then out went the screw, which is what I appreciate. So if you, you pick up anything intra-op, the best time to act is intra-op. Intra-op, yeah. Yes. So the, so the screw was rightly removed. Be happy with that. Yes, both. Okay. Would you be proud of that effort if it is your effort? Yes, both. I mean, the fracture looks well reduced. I don't still see any neck of femur or tetracanteric fracture. Yeah. Okay. And he started healing at six weeks. All right. So the same at six weeks, you've got nice colors formation. You still happy? Yes, prof. Okay, that's him at three months. Yeah. So it looks like he had a subcapital neck of femur that was missed. Do you think so? Well, I mean, that was pre-op, nothing. Pre -op. We, we, we don't, we, unfortunately, we didn't uh, get a CT, but uh, it doesn't, yeah. But I mean, if, if, if missed, um, it's lateral necrofemur fractures, you know, when do you often discover them? Um, Intra-op. Intra-op with proximal locking. And if you miss it then, when does it often manifest? Um, immediate post up when um, when they start mobilizing. So I mean, yeah, when they start this mobilizing, guy to come this. I mean, that's him at six weeks. You can see he's got colors formation already. Formation, yeah, and, and the neck is intact. That's him at yeah. three months now, and suddenly it's off. Of course, he, he didn't give a very you know or she didn't give a very detailed history of her fall. You know, um, mm. three months, but that's always concerning. Yeah. Anyway. Here we are, so we're two from here.
So what are the possible scenarios here? Just like talk me through um, what you're thinking. Um, well, I see that Fractured Destaly has united. So at this point we can, um, Prof, sorry, how old is he again? Hey, um, let me try, okay, I can check on my one. He's 45. 45. Yeah. That's, that's still young. Um, so, Prof, uh, I think in his case, we can take out the nail, seeing that the distal fracture is united, and then try um, an open reduction and fixation with cantilator screws. Um, okay, what, three, what do you think of the fracture line? I mean, what's the failure rate with that fracture line? And this uncertain history, and we don't know how long it has been like that for. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's uh, it's quite uh, vertical. It's probably like a pro three. Um, yeah, prof. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, prof. Okay. Alrighty. So, like I said, I mean, before you finalize and, and decide on your treatment plan, but what possible scenarios exist um, in this case? Um, in, in terms of his injury... So, one of the scenarios you said, the, sh the femur shaft is united, okay? Are yeah. you sure about that? Well, from this view, I, I see bridging colors um, in the AP. Um, we don't have um, a lateral view at three months to be certain, but in the mm -hmm. AP, I can see bridging colors on at least on two uh, cortices. But is it mature colors? Mm, no. Yes, okay. maybe. Yeah. No, I'm not saying it's much. I just, I just want you to be sure. What, like, what is bridging colors? What is bridging colors? It's it's when the um. Now it, I just went blank now. So. <laughs> Okay. Um, on X-ray, so our union, you want to have at least uh, colors on three cortices. So you'd see the new bone formation from one cortex to the other. What I'm saying is that there is new bone formation, but is, is every new bone formation and colors formation union? Well, at three months, it's a bit uh, early to say he's united, I must say. Okay. But I mean... That's the sort of not the kind of colors that you would be happy with, you know. Yes. I'm not saying you will be. Okay, so so that's the one scenario here we're discussing union versus non-union. What are the other possibilities? What else concerns you here? You can phone a friend. Okay, I'll pick a friend for you. Um, Peter Fenter. Yes, bro. What are your other concerns here? Right. I think they're all in As you said, you, you don't know about the how old that fracture is. And the, plan, the thing is, you can't fix it. So you're, you're aiming for replacing. But in order to replace, you have to have stability at that distal fracture site. Um, yeah, Let's so concentrate on the proximal part. So you're saying yeah. you're discussing mostly, uh, you're saying we can fix it. So obviously, you're thinking fixation versus replacement. What else can yep. you make the decision? What else must you consider about that fracture? Uh, it's shortening. Okay, you so switch off. Um, let's go to Santa. What are your other concerns, Santa? Sorry, Prof, can you repeat the question? No, I say we're discussing uh, what scenarios will help you decide um, what to do here. So there's a question of whether the distal fragment, the distal fracture is healed or not. There's a, a concern about the chronicity of the fracture line proximally. There's a concern about the, the angle of the fracture line. What else will, should you throw into the equation to help you decide? Um. So, Prof, uh, you'll always have to look at the host as well. Is he okay, even no, properly? No, you look at the host, he's fit for surgery. 
you you can do a CT scan to see if that if that um, diaphyseal fracture has healed. Okay. So your I, question I will be: Can you remove the nail or not? Is no, the no, I'm still talking about the, wait, wait, wait. I'm still talking about the proximal fracture now. We've discussed fracture line orientation. We've discussed chronicity. What else should matter in this case? That will uh, that will determine uh, how you proceed. Well, the, the age of the patient, activity level of the patient. He's forty-five. Yeah, so that, yeah. that fracture line, and if it's chronic, I mean, the, you've got AVN probably of that femoral head already. Okay, so well, you don't know. So you have to discuss the viability of the femoral head. You know, is it viable? Is it dead? We don't know that. Okay, so I mean, that's what I wanted to get out of here. So we're gonna go back to you then. Um, Benjamin. So, I mean, if you summarize, yes, you, these are the scenarios. So, you can have a head that's viable and the okay. shaft fracture is united. Is that mm. good or bad? Uh, that's good. Do you, really, do, you, do you really want that head to be viable? Do you want that head to be viable? Because if it's viable, what does it mean for you? Well, at age 45, then at least you know you can um, fix it. But what do you think the chances of success are fixing that thing? With a nail inside you with screws only. Yeah. Um, not, not, not that great. The chronicity, great. Of, and also we're not sure about the chronicity. Yeah. Okay, another scenario. If your head is viable and your shaft fracture is not united. Huh. Um, that's also, that, that's not a good scenario. Why not? Uh, well, what would you do? It, 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 means, it, means you need to, it means you need to replace the head. No, no, the head is viable and your shaft oh, fracture I mean, is not united. So, isn't that like a nice situation to have? So, you can just throw in a careful major nail there. Surely, that's not a bad scenario to have. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the head is dead and the shaft fracture is united. What are you gonna do? Um, then, Prof, you need to replace the head. Yes. Okay. Um, fine. So that means a replacement. And if your yeah, head is unviable and the shaft fracture is not united, um, Prof, you can take out the nail, replace the head, and then use a plate. Okay. Right, let's see. So I said, when is the fracture united? Because I mean, you agree it's important in this case that you know you need to decide if it's healed or not. So of course, yes, you know, yes. you've got the clinical um, examination, but of mm. course you've got X-rays or, or rather radiology to assist you. X-rays, yes, something mentioned the CT scan. So there's your X-ray, you are undecided. So you did a CT scan. Does it mm. help you decide? Yeah. Um, well, you can see colors there, but you can also see the fracture sites. Um, but I think it's united, I would okay. say. So you want to throw all your money at Union? Um, it's tricky, yeah. Okay, so if you did a CT scan and you could see the fracture line, you'd see the guy, okay, fine, you can go, it's united. Prof, come again, sorry. No, I'm saying if you did an X-ray and you weren't sure and you sent mm -hmm. someone for a CT scan and then yeah. you could still see the fracture line in CT, would you then send him off and say it's now healed? Um, no, no. Um, can still see the fracture line, Prof. <laughs> so I, I won't say he's totally healed. <laughs> okay. So how many years have you done orthopedics for now? Uh, four years, Prof. So... The Clinical examination, X-ray, and the CT. You can tell me where the fracture is healed. Um, Prof, I, I think it's too early to call it a non-union um, at three months. Uh, but also... So are you changing tech now? Because you said it was united. Well... From this, I can see that the um, there is bridging. Um, 
bone across the fracture site, but I can also see the uh, the fracture uh, line. So I won't. Uh, okay, there are retract. I won't be confident to say he's totally <laughs> united. Okay, then we're going to head viability. How will we decide if the head is viable or not? Um, Prof, I think we can do an MRI for that. Okay. Oh, sorry, one more CT scan for you. Does it help you? One more view. Yeah, that's one in lateral. And then here again, we can see the colors um, as in bridging bone, but also we can see the fracture sites as well. Okay, so we're still not sure, okay? Mm. And then we discuss the head viability. There you go. Yeah. Is the head viable or not? Um, I feel like I'll answer for you just in the interest of time. So one of the most difficult decisions, certainly in acute trauma and uh, displaced necrofemur fractures is deciding if the head is vascularized or not. And at the moment, there is no reliable test. Because if you do an MRI acutely, the head will look like the other side. So you can tell from the MRI if it's, uh, if it's still vascularized or not. Hence the two heads here look the same, but of course, the other one may be completely devascularized. Okay. Okay, moving along. So, what are you going to do for her? Okay, fine. I'll move um, on. To you. I'll give you the option. So, you must just pick which one you think will okay. work for you. Retain, retain the nail and fix the neck. Yes or no? Um, Anyhow, no. you're going to fix the neck. Anyhow, you're going to fix it. But would that be an option for you? Yeah, that, that, that can work, but I'm wondering what you'd fix the neck with retaining the nail. You said cannulated screws, didn't you? Yes, so you can go around, yeah. Okay, remove the nail and fix the neck, viable option. Um, now, yes, Prof, if, if, the, if you... the distal fracture is united. Okay, because now this one, of course, gives you more options proximally, you can Use a few more devices. Yeah. Okay, remove nail and THR. Yes, no? Um, that's also an option if the distal fract uh, uh, fracture is united, Prof. And if the head is uh, non viable. Okay. So remove the nail THR and plate the shaft. Um, prof, you can also do that if the fracture is non united, yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's the first, sorry, that's the same as the first option. Right, mm -hmm. so now pick one, I've given you all the information that we could possibly get from this case. Yeah. Um, now, Prof, you said, you said to pick one. Yes. Um, Prof, are we certain the head is viable or not? I, and I, if the, I don't know, I'm telling you that the, these are all the options that I can give you, and I've given you all the information I've got. Uh, I've got no further information. Okay, at age 45, um, I, I think I will, it's difficult to say, try fix the neck and then place the femur as well, um, removing the nail. So I'll, okay. so I'll go for the plate shafts, um, Removing the nail, the, 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 the fourth one. So keep nail. That's it then. Plate shaft. No, no, but remember, okay, it's fine. Anyway, I'll show you what we did. So of course, yeah, the most difficult part was deciding whether the, the, the shaft is fractured or not, you know? Mm. I mean, sorry, whether the shaft is united or not. I we, yeah. we assume that look at the head, whatever happens here, yeah, that head is unfixable whether it's because of AVN or because of the orientation of the fracture line and the chronicity, but I mean, you can't win fixing that, uh, that femoral head, right? Okay, yeah. So it'll be fine. Let's just take the nail out and then see what you get. And, you know, so nail out, like give me two weeks to mobilize and see what happens to the, to the, to the shaft. And of course the shaft, nothing happened. It didn't break and mm. then did the total hip. And because the, the issue is that the stem would end exactly at the fracture side. Of course, you yeah. can remove all doubt and just 
you know, fix, I'm sorry, replace, and then fix the, the, the shaft with the plate. You know, it's, it, it's another option. Mm. But, but it is, he went on to unite. He said, now I'd be happy to call it that united. You can see the difference in the colors. Yeah, this is like much more mature colors. Mm. You know. I Okay, look at it as you know. Oh, with, with this sorry, thing, I just want to ask around. something. Yes, yeah, sometimes. Would, would you have considered a long stem THR here? Yes, yeah, that was a, another option just to get like a, a very long stem system. But remember, long though is like another panel of four centimeters. So it could have stopped here. So it doesn't really answer, you know, help you deal with this problem. Okay, okay. You know. Okay, what's the time? 10, okay, just someone to go quickly through this one. So it's a 38 year old with segmental femur fracture. Who shall we pick? Um, let's see. Um, who's MT? Oh, they're not gonna say ED. Oh, claiming a fifth amendment, I see. Okay, uh, okay, Johan, we'll go for you. We'll go with Johan then. Hey, Prof. You ready? Ready, Prof. Okay, this is your guy. So, close segmental femur fracture. He's got bilateral ankle fractures and he's systemically well. Okay. Okay, so I'm printed with the right femur x rays, an AP, and what seems like a lateral view. And um, like Prof gave in the history, it's a segmental femur fracture um, with a transverse fracture orientation proximal, um, distal with some comminution as well. Um, it's difficult for me to assess if there is involvement of the ipsilateral femoral neck uh, due to the Thomas splint, but it's something that I would definitely um, be cautious about because we do see them commonly in this femoral fractures um, that I suppose was a high velocity injury. So I would definitely want to exclude that. And um, I will take the patient for surgery and my implant um, choice will be also a cephalo medullary nail. Can you just talk us through your name? Just your naming technique? Prof, um, I would have a low um, threshold to open this fracture to assist um, with my reduction. You can see on that lateral view already, um, uh, due to the muscle forces, there's angulation of the proximal fragment. Um, so I think opening this up from the start um, is a good option. Uh, to assist you with the reduction, to use large bone clamps to assist you with that, um, to get your guide wire across there. Um, yeah, so I would definitely open this up um, and use a, a, a bone holding forceps and an assistant to, to, to reduce this um, and to get my wire across. It's fine. Actually, out of curiosity, that's what we did for his ankles. Okay. It was a time when we were fletching with fibula nails. But you know, as you know, we've long stopped using them. Anyway, that's what you've got pushed off. What happened there? Mm. I thought you had a good surgical plan. Your profit almost looks like they almost looks like they did a corticotomy, it seems. It's difficult to say, but it looks like there was definitely some oscillating bone sore on the lateral cortex. Um I don't know if it was to aid their reduction. No you know? they, yeah, it's it's just, transverse. Yeah, okay. It was always transverse. Oh, they probably they probably just removed um they probably removed that bone um, fragment. I think it was probably devascularized when they opened up um and it was removed because I can't see that lateral wall there. Um what do you think it is? Probably in some kidney dish, prof. <laughs> no, who else can offer a, a, a solution or an answer? The the missed missed segment. Segment. Yes. The, the nail missed, missed the, the, ca yeah. the canal yeah. that yeah. do uh, segment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. switch off. So you agree, Johan? Yes, yes, I do, prof. I can see that okay. clearly now. Yeah, so they, they what are you going to do now? 
Prof, you're definitely going to have to do, do revise this um, and then uh, remove your nail and um, you know, pay attention to your surgical technique not to miss that um, middle segment. Have you seen this before? Prof, I, I have not seen this before, but I can imagine that it's something that can happen quite easily. So then if you're finished with something that you haven't seen before, what do you do? You go to the literature, right? You go yes, up Prof. Out. Okay, yes. so that's what, that's what I did also. Nothing, never been done before. Yeah, I see. Okay, so now you need to clean out of the box. Yeah, Prof, um, the other option, yeah, the other option is, well, the, I'm happy with the length, what I'm seeing here now, um, is to give it a chance to see what, what, what the fracture does um, and see if it heals because the alignment and the length is not bad. So um, you can always see if this will incorporate, if the bridging callus will incorporate that segment and just leave it, leave as is, um, instead of um, taking the patient back, re-exposing him to anesthesia, um, you can always uh, wait and see. If this was your femur, would you be happy to wait and see? No, no prof. Um, yeah. <laughs> so why are you offering yeah, it to someone yeah, else then? Yeah. yeah, no, I hear you prof, I hear you. Um, I'm just thinking from yeah, putting the patient through another anesthesia. So that was just my train of thought. But yeah, I hear you. I would then go and revise it and pay attention to to do it properly and to make sure that you you get that middle segment as well um, and include that in your in your open reduction internal fixation. Yeah, you can also look at that. I think if you're gonna want to, to revise it, you need to check because if it's just a very really commuted fragment, then of course you can just put the bone pieces around the nail, but if it's got a, a canal like this one, you need to ream this yeah. canal. So you must control yeah. the fragment and then yeah. ream the canal. Okay. Yes, Prof. Alrighty. So that's basically, you know, again, one of, one of those things where the, the answer was made or rather the answer was, I mean, the, the decision was made to just observe it and see how it went. And of course it disappeared for four years. It became like four <laughs> years later, <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Without any revision, like uh, this is with no revision. So yeah. I'm not saying that you must plan to, you know, or aim to, to miss segments of bone, but yeah, that's yeah. what happened. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and when he, you know, he united I mean, at four years, if nothing is broken, nothing is going to break further. Okay, guys, so uh, that brings us to the end of the first part. So I'll give you a quick three minutes comfort break and then we'll go to the presentation. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, two minutes is up. Um, let's load this. Sorry, I'll skip the last case and ready. So, um, I mean, our you know, topic for tonight is meant to be femur fractures, uh, shaft and um, and distal third. There really isn't much more to discuss, you know, in terms of the shaft fractures. So, I'm going to concentrate mostly on the distal third fractures. And um, importantly, also, you know, this is not going to be a scientific talk, you know, or a literature review. That's something that you can do um, on your own. So I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna use some case examples just to to illustrate, to illustrate our current practice and importantly um, what uh, informs um, our philosophy when we treat these injuries. So I'm gonna flip this. So I'll start with our take home messages. So you know, as you all know, our philosophy is that when it comes to distal femur fractures nail what you can nail and if you think that it is maybe not nailable you must nail it still and i'll show you examples of why and if you think it's definitely not nailable then you send it to bfm and we'll nail it for you and that's called supreme nailing and if we also think that it's not nailable then you'll plate it with a laterally based plate but importantly, if it's a reverse obliquity pattern, then you need to double plate it. And if it's not plateable, then you have to consider the placement. So our goals are anatomical deconstruction and also, you know, you want rigid fixation of the metaphysical or rather of the articular component at uh, the joint surface. And we rely on relative stability most of the time. There are a few instances where you can go for absolute stability if you've got no communication. And uh, uh, importantly, of course, we do all of this so you can mobilize them early. And you can achieve this with plates or with nails. Now, you know, if you look at locking plates, you know, they've been around for a while. We know where locking plates work and we know where they don't work and probably the most common area where locking constructs fail is in the proximal femur and so that's why we don't use them routinely but right after proximal femur is going to be distal femur if i mean i can challenge you to walk into any morning meeting you no know, tomorrow in some hospital in this country they are somewhere in the world there is going to be a distal femur plate that has failed. And when you look and scrutinize the images, that distal femur plate will have only locking screws. And I'm sure many of you have seen this in the hospitals that you've worked in or you've worked in before. And it's all different ways that, the, um, that this, these patterns or rather these failures occur. And it also importantly, you know, I wrote here that all the gear and no idea it's not because we don't have the implants. We've got like access to like a you know, number of, uh, of, you know, of implants to use, but it's a question of how we use it and understanding the principles of what, of what you're trying to achieve. And another example, again, so this is going to be a recurring theme. Most of the plates you see are going to be, you know, errors which are correctable and by far the commonest error is going to be short plate, short rigid segment, locking screws only. And that's just bound to fail. Now, if you look at um, just at the evolution of um, surgical fixation or, or rather of treatment of uh, distal femur fractures, you'll see that, that there's been a trend over the years. So this is just the evolution where the initial management um, in the on the yellow line was non-surgical and this you know, constant, uh, was composed of traction and sometimes plaster cast but of course it was associated with complications of prolonged recumbency and prolonged mobilization so surgery had to be attempted and that is the red line so from the 1940s there were early surgical attempts but these were you know, they produce such poor results 
But, you know, after a while, like just in the late 50s, it was felt that no distal femur fractures were amenable to surgical treatment, simple as that. It was really after the 1960s that uh, the AO was formed and then the development of the AO principles of, uh, of ORIF and then now the, the arrival of the 95 degree plate. So this was the game changer. So this is the, the, the 95 degree plate. So it allowed um, the, the pendulum to swing back towards surgery and, and the results were better. And then this for, so when you go to make them cottage and you do proximal female osteotomies, I, I don't know if Andrea uses the blade plate, but that's where it came from, you know, in the distal femur. And then that was followed by the dynamic condylar plate and screw, which is the equivalent of a DHS, but it's a DCS. So same construct, but it's 90 degrees in the distal femur, instead of uh, 125 degrees in the proximal femur. So this, so what it allowed was just compression at the joint surface and, and also some flexibility in turn because you could have it as a 90 or 95 degree um, DCS. So now this was followed by emergence of the intramedullary nail. So the IM nail suddenly provided a load sharing construct and the union rates were excellent actually. But the problem with the nail is that the very distal fractures and comminution was still a problem. So hence, the, you know, you, you can see the graph then goes down after a while. And then came the lateral condylar buttress plate. So what it addressed was periarticular comminution and it addressed this quite well. But because it wasn't angular stable, it had a tendency to various collapse. So the answer now, you had to have something that was angular stable, which also allowed you compression at the fracture side, and hence now the emergence of the distal femur plates, the lateral plates, because now they offered you both options, angular stability, as well as compression at the fracture side. And uh, I mean, they've been around for probably 15, 20 years now, and the use is going up. But you'll see that now this graph is starting to plateau. And the problem here is that now there are many failures associated with the plates. So there needs to be you know, a, a different solution. So what about males? So as we know, males are load sharing. And I mean, in our hands, we find them very forgiving. And importantly, they are minimally invasive. So the problem with distal femur fractures, of course, is uh, the very tenuous blood supply. Because if you look at um, mid sharp femur fractures, you hardly get no union. Proximal period fractures, subtrochs, you don't often get um, non unions or delayed unions, and that mirrors the blood supply. But distally, the blood supply isn't that great. And now the poor blood supply, combined, of course, with the difficulty in finding the perfect implant results in lots of uh, failure rate for, for these injuries. So this is an example, 26 year old male, gunshot wound. So I just want you to give it some thought uh, in terms of what you would do. And of course, many of you have sort of bought into our philosophy now. So you will all be thinking, you know, along the same lines, but this kind of injury generates a lot of discussion at meetings because like, of course people um, approach them differently. You know, you would agree that plating is an option here for some people. Uh, you could do a prograde nail, you could do a retrograde nail. There are still many people out there who are anti-retrograde nails, um, firstly on their own because they feel that they violate um, the knee joint unnecessarily but even worse uh, to do a retrograde nail for an open fracture. But again, the, the literature is very clear on this and we are going to produce evidence of our own as well to show that it's absolutely safe to do a retrograde nail. Okay, so what we did for this was, so the beauty with the third generation nails is that you get locking in different planes, you know, so it really is uh, that much more angular stable. Uh, compared to the old um, Russell Taylor nails. And this is him at, uh, at six months, doing well. And I mean, 
certainly when I was training, we did not do any retrograde nails and no, there's no consultant that would have agreed to nail something like this. So the answer back then was only a DCS. And um, I, mean, I sort of caught the back end of the DCS um, time. And in fact, I actually think I did the last DCS at Holy Sky. For a long time, I had, um, I had that exit um, at home, just that now with the many moves, uh, I've since lost it. But uh, so something like this is something that we consider as normal nailing, but in many centers, they would feel that this is quite extreme to nail and they would consider printing. And, and, and like I said, you know, the concern about the violation of the knee joint is, um, is not valid. And we get uh, great results for this. And I mean, this was segmental, so even more reason to, to go for the nail. So the, the only difficulty with nailing with this cell femur is that you've got quite a wide metaphysical box. So under the mid shaft or, or the proximal third, where the isthmus will help you reduce your fracture. And as you pass the nail, then again, the fracture reduces. The distal third and importantly, the metaphysical box does not reduce if you do not, um, sorry, the nail doesn't reduce the fracture for you. It needs to be reduced before the nail goes in or, or, or the nail simply follows the guide wire. So this is an example. So yeah, this is where you need to remember which way the blocking screw or the polar screw goes. I simplified by saying that you put the locking, the blocking screw on the side where you want the bone to go. That's how I just simplify it for myself. So here you can see that this femur, the distal fragment is gone medially. You want it to go laterally to match the proximal cortex. So you put your, your blocking screw laterally. Okay, so you put the screw where you want the nail to go. And uh, so that's the guide wire in. Some put the nail before the guide wire, put it after. It, I, I tend to put it once I put the guide wire in and then and I see what I need to correct. Then I put the nail such that when the rima hits the wire, then the reduction takes place. So this is on the AP plane and uh, that, that's the guide wire. And now the polar screw is in. You can use a drill bit, you can use a real screw. I prefer to put a screw. And that's the screw in. And now you start rimming. So you see, as a rimmer hits the screw, then we'll get your reduction. This is both on the AP plane. And then on the lateral view, also same thing. Here, your, bo your bone has gone anteriorly. You want it to go posteriorly. So you put your polar screw posteriorly. Nail will hit this, hit that, and reduce your fracture. So that's as the nail is introduced, and that's in the AP view. And so the, um, that's just where the guard wire, so before the nail goes in, that's the rima, and that's the nail going in. See how it's navigating its way past the screw. So this is why I prefer the screw, because you can sometimes bend the drill bit if you, um, if you use the drill bit technique. And that's the nail reducing on the natural view, and that's on the AP view. So this is how you meant to use your blocking screws, and that is the end result of that. And it's automatically reduced. Um, different techniques that you need. Uh, again, for a distal third like this, if the if the nail itself will not reduce this for you. It is way too long to try and reduce this with, uh, with polar screws. They simply won't work. So the best thing to do here is just to open the fratricide, clamp it, and pass a cable. And once you've passed the, passed the cable, then it becomes uh, a fairly easy and straightforward nail to do. Um, I mean, um, as you see in this picture, you know, nails are that much more fun. They are that much more elegant. You know, yeah, Imagine if you try to print the femur, print the, the tibia, the, the, the damage to the soft tissues is quite extensive. But also importantly, nails are sexy. Um, and they're more forgiving. So I'll show you. So we've seen with that example with uh, with Hunis, where we had that uh, nail that missed the segment. And what you'll see here, again, another segment of femur fracture. Nail is in. Again, you know, you've not really caught that, 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 that segment. But of course, it's completely split, so it's difficult to run the nail through that. And for something like this, you, know, you would be concerned about a plate, and the nail will sort of uh, carry that load, and you see it's gone on to union. 
at, um, at one year. Uh, another example, uh, gunshot pistol third. So here, this was nailed, but you can see that the screws are breaking out. Now, plate screws often, you know, they're locked into the plate, they don't break out, they simply break. So if this was a plate, it would most probably have broken. But what you can do with the nail is, um, see, the screws are breaking out completely. We simply remove the screws and uh, drill nailed it and just put the screws in slightly different parts of the bone and he went on to union. So I, I know, just another example of how nails are, are very forgiving. Okay, so what about plates? So we know plates are load bearing. They, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, excuse me. They are quite useful in osteoporotic bone. And uh, <coughs> so, so if there's combination in the periarticular fragments, then of course your, your plate will address that better than your nails will. And plates can be done also minimally invasive, but if, you know, if you feel your lateral, you know, femoral condyle, it is quite subcutaneous. And also if you're, I mean, you're, so the plates can be quite bulky. And if your screws uh, are slightly longer than the metacritical box, it's gonna irritate uh, the patients. And, and, and as you know, we have a zero tolerance policy for long screws in the femur, certainly in the distal part of the femur. And um, of course, you know, plates warrant um, open surgery. You know, we've discussed the blood supply, and now if you're gonna open with the plate, you disrupt whatever little there is uh, in the distal fragment. That's, that's why, if possible, we try and get um, minimally invasive for C-synthesis. So I said earlier on that if you look at many failures, you know, they are not related to the use of the wrong implant, but it's just the poor application of the correct implant, or at least implant that is not necessarily incorrect for the for that fracture. So most failures are preventable. And uh, most of them actually is because the, the implant is too rigid. And as, a, as a, our unit policy, we routinely do not use knuckle screws in the shaft, and I'll show you some examples. And you need to keep an eye out for reverse obliquity fractures. So there's an example of what you typically get. Um, so distal femur fracture. So there are many crimes in this X-ray, but probably the biggest one of them all is that you've got fracture that is not anatomically reduced. You've got what is an interfragmentary screw that is locked. So now this fracture is just basically got nowhere to go. It, it has to fill because it's not compressed anatomically. So you're not going to get uh, healing by uh, primary intention. It is not flexible at the fracture site and it's kept apart by the locking screw. So you're not going to get colors formation either because there's no movement. So it can only go one way and that means it can only fail. And of course, there's no surprise there that it's failed. And if you notice now the difference between the failed X-ray, excuse me, and the salvage X-ray is just the removal of that screw in the fracture site. And I mean, I don't know why they put a cable in there, but maybe it was Mike and Abramson. But th there's no reason for a cable here. This just had to have that screw removed and it went on to unite. And there's nothing that the, the cable achieved. So, the biology is important, but the mechanics are just as important. Uh, here's a 31 year old, gunshot injury. Again, yeah, same problem. Look here, I mean, he's got a vascular injury, so his peeling is further compromised. And he's got a short plate and he's got a lot of screws. And again, you know, this is predictable. So, this is not a non union. It's not a failed fixation, it's just a planned failure of, uh, of fixation because you could have avoided this. Now, we discussed this briefly last week, um, but if you look at um, you know, our uh, principle of plating distal femur fractures, it's always, um, or rather it's mostly um, bridge plating and healing by colors formation. Now, where the confusion comes is that in terms of choosing the plate length, the, the principles for bridge plating when, the, um, when these plates came out 
was that the plate has to be three times the length of the flexure. Um, but of course, that's not possible. In It's easy in the shaft, yes, because you've got the proximal segment to work with. You've got the distal segment to work with. So, so your plate can be three times the length. The anatomy of the bone allows you that. But if your fracture is metaphysial, you don't have three times the length to go down this way. You can only go up. But there's no rule that says your plate must be three times in one direction only. Okay, it's three times, but above and below the fracture, not three times above the fracture only or three times the fracture only. And that's the rule that gets misunderstood and misquoted by most people. So the screw density ratio and the three times the length only applies for deficit fractures. And I remember I even asked Peter Fenty that, okay, fine, if you want your plate to be three times longer than the fracture, how come your decelerator's plates are so short? How come your proximal tibial plates are so short? And how can your proximal humerus plates are so short? Because when you plate those fractures, there's not a single time that you aim for the plates to be three times longer than the, um, than the fracture zone. You know, all you want is to spend the fracture and then you get the first three holes that the plate allows you to get. So that's the principle that we use also in distal femur fractures. And um, so again, you know, people talk about working length. Uh, so, so working length basically is the, you know, the distance between the first screw distally and the first screw proximal to the fracture side. So again, those rules really apply, strictly speaking, to the diaphysis. For the metaphysis, what do you want in terms of working length? You want, you know, and, and it's very difficult to quantify, you want a long enough working length that your first screw is not directly boom, just like just above the fracture side. So we often do it about three or four centimeters above the fracture side, and that's where your first screw is going to be. And we do only three screws proximally. I know some of the consultants want to do four and some of you do four, but three is more than adequate. I've not seen a three home plate or rather three, three screws break because the fixation was not adequate. These are just examples of how we used to apply these plates when uh, when they first came out. You know, there was a near, near, far, 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 near, near. And, and what we learned from this paper was that it actually doesn't really matter what your, work, your screw density is, what your fracture zone was. You know, what mattered was that your screws must not be locked. And what caused um, non-union is other things that we know like diabetes and malignancy and, and a rigid construct. So the only thing that caused failure or delayed union was a rigid construct with locking screws plus systemic disease. But if you're using non-locking screws, you can use them anyhow you want. So you've got that configuration here. You've got this configuration here. These are both fine and they didn't fail. But of course you can have you know, like I said, 10 different people doing things in 10 different ways because when things fail, you don't know when to start correcting them or how, where to start. So we decided to standardize our practice so that if we get poor results, then we change one thing at a time. So that's when we made the decision to use only non log screws in the shaft and only three screws and just keep enough working length above the fracture. Don't aim for three times the length of the fracture. And, you know, I challenge now most of you to remember the last distance from a plate that has failed. And I mean, every time I say that, of course, I say touch wood with this principle. So what I said, so previously, this is what we did. You know, like everyone did like, things differently and some failed, and so, you know, and some succeeded, but we've now stopped doing this. So this is our current policy. And uh, what we look for is you want to bridge the fracture and you have three non locking screws in the shaft and that's gone on to union. And if you look at this, it's not too dissimilar to the previous one that was gunshot and these three were locked and it went on to fail. Give yourself enough distance from the from this fracture line to the, lot, to the first screw, that's about three, four centimeters and then three screws proximal to that non locking. Distal box will lock. And uh, that's another example, again, three screws. This is a screw that really doesn't contribute much. It would have been used just to pull the fragments together, but you forgot to take it out. But again, because it's in the fracture zone, it doesn't really, you know, uh, matter. It, it just makes for an ugly X-ray. But what matters here again is the spinning the fracture 
and giving yourself enough space from the front side to the first screw and then three non knob screws. Um, another example of a very long plate. So now here the question is, we said that we give ourselves three or four holes from the last you know, fracture line. Here is a bit longer purely because the next plate that comes is this length. So now it, it sort of forces your hand now to use those three holes. We could of course maybe really skip that one and use this hole, would have been fine too. But importantly here, long segment, long plate, but still only three screws in the shaft and it's going to unite. Um, and then if for any reason you want to use lock screws, and I know that some of you are gonna go out there and start practicing and then start using lock screws. And uh, I've had one, two, three guys uh, send me x-rays of failed distal femur plates after they left the rotation and they failed. And when I asked them, but why did you lock? And the answer is, ah, I, thought, I thought I must just try something different. But of course you were right, I won't do it again. So I mean, I you know, just ask all of you that if you are going, so firstly stay away from the screws in the shaft, but if you are going to use them for whatever reason, give yourselves enough working them. Okay. So I'm not saying don't ever use them. There's no rule like that, but just that as a unit, you know, that's our policy. So what about reverse obliquity fractures? Okay, so if you look at all the literature that you're going to read on distal film, film of fractures, they're based on fairly transverse osteoporotic fractures or on this configuration where the spike exits on the lateral side. This is a common spartan. So, so, so the spike exits on, exits on the lateral side. And this is what I've termed a normal obliquity. So that's the spike, or it can be just in the box uh, and, and fairly transverse like that. And of course here, it's easy. Now, AO principles will tell you that you must anti-glide and put your plate on the side. Okay. So that's what's happened here. And now look at these two fracture patterns. Again, I said normal obliquity, the apex is lateral, there's a fibula, lateral apex. It's begging for a lateral base plate. But in the reverse obliquity, your apex is medial. So now you can see, and remember that in your knee joint, there are more forces on the medial joint line versus the lateral joint line. So your axis is slightly more medial. That's why you get more OA on the medial joint line and not the lateral joint line. So if you put a if you put a lateral based plate on this, you are not countering. Yes, of course you are using a angular stable plate, but the forces here are massive, and you are not countering that. Um, that various force on that um, on that condyle. So this is what you're going to get. Apex medial, laterally base plate, starts fading because you can see the forces go through there. And the only way to correct this is to put your medially based uh, anti-glide plate on that side just to stop that apex from displacing. Uh, another example, again, apex medial, and someone who did not listen, I went and did um, a beautiful, what they term as a beautiful plate. And this, of course, when it looks deceiving, it looks like it's well, it's, it's nicely aligned, but you know where this is gonna go. Again, same issue. It's gonna cut out, uh, as it's gonna displace immediately because of that normal forces. And on the way to correct it, okay, would have been at the time of surgery, recognize the fracture pattern and put in medially based plate. And then that would, spare you all the troubles. Again, short oblique, uh, but still apex medial, it needs a medial plate. Um, this uh, some of Maritz's uh, excellence also. So same, I mean, just to show that it's not my philosophy only, um, these are Maritz's cases. Spike, medial, medially based plate. Another example. Spike medial in a immediately base plate. Or of course, if you don't want to, so the difference between plate and a nail is that even with the immediately based apex, if you're going to nail it, then it doesn't matter because the mechanics are completely different uh, to, to a plate. So you can still nail this if it's nailable without having to worry now about the, the virus collapse. 
Uh, so is there a place for primary healing? Yes, there is. I didn't get a chance to load like just the last X-ray we did um, two weeks ago, where if it's a clean fracture line, then of course you can put an interfragmentary screw. It just makes your life easy and also makes for an easy operation. But again, you see, you just have like I said, these screws here are not locked. And because here yeah, your healing is now interfragmentary, you know, you've got uh, interfragmentary compression. These are now suddenly become neutralization screws or protection screws, but still, though, I would not have put this one this close, so I would just take it and put it there or up there. But there is a place for compression um, across the fracture side. Okay, and lastly, uh, you know, there are some cases where, you know, yeah, when I spoke about extreme plating, um, extreme nailing, and this is a fairly commemorated distal femur fracture that Travers was very proud of his effort and him and Prof. Roche um, opted to nail it. I think it was done like as an orange case or something like that. But, uh, you know, if you look at this, it's it's a bag of bones. You know, it's, it's never a good idea to, to plate this. But of course they tried and that's the post-op x-ray. It looked very good and same principles followed. And I think it reduced, but the difficulty here, look, I don't have the X-ray of when um, it, it, it actually failed, but it, it, it eventually failed. So this is something I would have considered um, distal femur replacement, you know, uh, primarily. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this. Um, I feel like I, I've been talking um, to the computer on my own, but um, just to recap on our take-home messages, nail what you can nail. So like I said, I mean, um, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, nails will get you out of jail many, many times, uh, far more than plates will. And if you're going to get complications, it's often going to be with plating. And nails are very friendly to the soft tissue and distal femur plating in the soft tissues. Yes, of course, they're not as bad as distal tibia plating, but still, you know, open reduction versus closed reduction with the nails. You're always going to choose the closed reduction. And like I said, if you think it's maybe not nailable, still try to nail it or at least send it to someone who will nail it. And then if it's definitely not nailable, still try and nail it. And if it is really, really not nailable, then we opt for plating, but the plating has to be a laterally based plate. Um, and then if it's a reverse obliquity pattern, then you need to double plate it. There are some people who will talk about using a laterally based plate of the opposite side on the medial side of the other plate, I mean, of the other femur. Yeah. So again, that's people who recognize that a medially based plate is required, but unfortunately there are no anatomically uh, contoured medial distal femur plates. So we still believe in doing a laterally based plate and just augmenting it with a smaller plate medially. And then if you can't plate it, then you must consider a placement. Right on. So that brings us to the end of, um, of that. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor to, to questions.